Institutions. I am Sarah Lomax Reese, um, the president and CEO of WURD. And I have the, the honor and the privilege today of uh, moderating a, a really powerful panel discussion, again, in celebration of diversity, equity, and inclusion month. We are having what I'm calling a C-suite roundtable discussion. And um, C-suite, for, for those of you who are not familiar with that term, it just refers to executive level managers within a company. And we have three amazing uh, C-suite uh, leaders from the Philadelphia area who will be in conversation with me today. We have um, our Commerce Director, Michael Rashid, um, for the City of Philadelphia, and I'll give his bio in just a second. And we also have Ramona Risco Benson. She is the um, Director of Corporate and Community Relations for PICO. And we also have Delilah Wilson-Scott, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer for Comcast Corporation and the President of Comcast NBC Universal Foundation. Welcome all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Good yes, afternoon. So thank you, thank you. I, I'm um, really excited to have this conversation because I consider all of you not just uh, colleagues, but friends. So I'm hoping that we can have a, um, a robust conversation, but also one that is, is somewhat informal. Um, so so let's, um, let me just introduce you all. I'm sure a lot of people in our audience know your names, but they might not know the full breadth of your, of your backgrounds. And so as we jump into this, this conversation about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and what, the, what that looks like in the Philadelphia corporate landscape, um, let me just introduce you a little bit more. And I'll start with you, Michael. Um, Michael Rashid has made its, his life's work to ensure those most in need have access to one of the most basic of human rights, which is healthcare. Um, he was inspired by, he was inspired to a lifetime of service by accompanying his father on his rounds on behalf of the Negro Health and Tuberculosis Association during his youth in Birmingham, Alabama. Later, when Dr. King called for many to march in the name of justice, Michael answered the call, marching with Dr. King in the name of civil rights for African Americans and ultimately all people. And um, Michael has a long career in the healthcare industry, starting with being serving as the CEO of Total Healthcare in Baltimore, Maryland, one of the nation's first managed care plans. He's also hold, held numerous leadership positions of increasing responsibility over the years, including serving as executive vice president and chief operating officer for 15 years before becoming the president and CEO of AmeriHealth Caritas. Um, as the CEO of AmeriHealth Caritas family of companies, Michael was responsible for the leadership, strategic direction, business development, and operations of the company. And then in November 2020, Mayor Jim Kenney appointed Michael as the City of Philadelphia's Commerce Director, where he focuses on implementing fair, equitable, and inclusive business development efforts that help spread economic vitality and opportunity to all of Philadelphia's neighborhoods. So welcome again, Michael. Thank you. And then we have Ramona Risco Benson, and Ramona is PICO's Director of Corporate and Community Relations, as I said. She has more than 25 years of strategic leadership in the areas of nonprofit management, community affairs, event and convention planning, and tourism development and promotion. She oversees PICO's corporate social responsibility strategy while leading a team that directs the company's corporate philanthropy, employee giving, sponsorships, vulnerable customer outreach, workforce development, and employee engagement programs. And um, she joined PICO after serving as the president and CEO of the African American Museum in Philadelphia, where she led a turnaround strategy, directed a multi-million dollar building renovation project and installation of a nationally recognized exhibit in the early life of African Americans in Philadelphia, known as Audacious Freedom. Under her leadership, AMP significantly increased attendance, museum membership, programming, and stakeholder investment. And Ramona also owned her own consulting firm for 12 years uh, called Risco and Associates, providing capacity building services to nonprofits. Welcome, Ramona. And then we have, last but certainly not least, Delilah Wilson-Scott. She's the Executive Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer of Comcast Corporation and President of the Comcast NBC Universal Foundation. In this role, Delilah oversees all diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives and philanthropic strategy for the corporation, 
including the company's $100 million commitment to advance social justice and equality. Delilah also leads Comcast community impact initiatives working across the organization to provide strategic leadership throughout all aspects of its corporate social responsibility programs, including employee engagement and volunteerism. In addition, Delilah oversees efforts to utilize Comcast's world-class media platforms to bring greater attention to the work of, our, of their philanthropic partners. In 2020, Comcast provided nearly $500 million in total support to 4,500 nonprofit partners sharing Comcast's commitment to creating a more connected and equitable world. And Delilah joined Comcast in 2016 after more than 16 years at J.P. Morgan Chase & Company, where she served as head of global philanthropy and president of the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation. Woo, you guys got, and I didn't even read your whole bios. I just took a little snippet. So um, great to have you all here. And well, so um, Sarah, I want to start. Sarah, um, huh? Sarah, you didn't read your bio. You oh, your well. Bio. Let's hear your bio. That, yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm, 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 a, I'm the CEO of Word and I'm the moderator today. That's the extent of my bio, because this is really, I really want to hear from all of you. And because of this moment that we're in where, you know, this, this um, really historic verdict was just delivered yesterday and it was almost a year, uh, May 25th is when George Floyd was killed and that you know, um, explosive um, uh, racial justice protests and uprising really, really took off, not just uh, nationally, but globally. And in part, I want to start there because of this moment that we're in right here, right now. Everyone's talking about this, but it also relates very directly to this conversation because so much of the um, increased commitment and interest in diversity, equity, and inclusion by the corporate community was, um, was, was, was sparked by um, the, the racial justice protests. And so, you know, I wanted to ask you each, from just a personal standpoint, um, what, does, what does this moment mean to you having, you know, um, as because you all are, are you know, African-American people as well as corporate leaders, um, how has this moment resonated with you and what are some of the things that you're thinking or feeling or, or hearing just about this moment? And I'll start with you, Delilah. You know, I think what we all know and uh, sometimes it's hard to forget, right, is a life was lost and for his family, that void will never be replaced. Um, so th thoughts and prayers to the family for sure. Um, but it is a historic moment. It is a, a historic verdict in so many ways. I mean, people around the world watching this case and um, even yesterday, right? I was, I was holding my breath as the verdict was read or about to be read because I think so many of us have been in a situation before where uh, there wasn't accountability for similar situations. Um, and even in cases where you might feel there is overwhelming evidence, uh, we all have been in that place where we felt like accountability was not at the table. That said, you know, it was a catalyst for so many people to watch that nine minutes last year, to think about how real and tangible it was for so many people. I mean, you know, we have to experience and feel that type of adversity throughout our entire lives. But for many people, 2020 was the moment they recognized how deep, deeply rooted and seeded some of these issues are. Um, and it served as a catalyst, not just in corporate communities, but in communities broadly, globally, to reset our expectations around equity and to um, acknowledge that that this is a systemic issue. This is not about one isolated event. Um, so there was there was some opportunity created by that moment for sure. Um, and all of us know that the work is far from done, far from done. And you know, despite this one one verdict, uh, we know that that there is there is so much more that we need to 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 get further in our in our fight for equity. Ramona, what are your thoughts? No, I, you know, well said.
The National Weather Service has issued a severe thunderstorm warning for Newcastle County, Delaware, plus the following New Jersey counties Burlington, Camden, Gloucester, Mercer, and Salem, plus the following Pennsylvania counties Bucks, Chester, Delaware, Montgomery, and Philadelphia, effective until 2.10 p.m. The National Weather Service in Mount Holly, New Jersey has issued a severe thunderstorm warning for northern Newcastle County in northern Delaware. Northwestern Salem County in southern New Jersey, Northwestern Camden County in southern New Jersey, Central Mercer County in central New Jersey, Northwestern Gloucester County in southern New Jersey, Northwestern Burlington County in southern New Jersey, Southeastern Montgomery County in southeastern Pennsylvania, Southeastern Bucks County in southeastern Pennsylvania, Southeastern Chester County in southeastern Pennsylvania, Philadelphia County in southeastern Pennsylvania, Delaware County in southeastern Pennsylvania until 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. At 1.09 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, severe thunderstorms were located along a line extending from near Cheney to near Stanton, moving northeast at 60 miles per hour. Hazard, 60 miles per hour wind gusts and quarter size hail. Source, radar indicated. Impact, minor damage to vehicles is possible. Wind damage to roofs, siding, trees, and power lines is possible. Locations impacted include Philadelphia, Trenton, Camden, Wilmington, Newark, Westchester, Gloucester City, Cherry Hill, Bensalem, Evesham, Mount Laurel, Ewing, Chester, Willingbrook, Deptford, West Deptford, Princeton, Florence, Belmar, and Yadon. Where we see it, where we encounter it, and as leaders owning our own truth about it, uh, we have to be a part of this change we want to see in this city and mm -hmm. in the country. So absolutely, absolutely. Um, Michael Rashid, you know, you've you marched with, uh, you know, with Dr. King or in Alabama. So like, what does this moment mean for you? Well, after listening to, to, to these two eloquent ladies, I mean, I don't know what I can add. Uh, you know, yesterday um, at, in the city government, I was right there with the mayor and police chief and, and others. Uh, when the verdict was announced and, and um, just the sense of relief, the anxiety was at an all-time level. And I think that that release of anxiety was felt throughout the country. And so that was, that was a great thing. Um, I'd, I'd like to quote from a famous Philadelphian who I know some of us on the line know, and that's Mr. Will Smith. And, 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 and Will said, uh, race, racism and racist killings are not new. They have just recently been caught on film. Right. But these kinds of things have been going on for a long, long time. And, 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 uh, but, but now they're caught on film. Now, as you said, Ramona, they're, they're being seen. And so people's attention are, are, are being caught to them. What, what I think hopefully we can put an equal, equal, probably I'd like to see even more attention, however, brought to the idea of, us killing us, black people killing each other, um, which is 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 not is not being seen. Five hundred people in this in this city in this city died from you know murder were murdered last last year, and I don't know the number, but I'm sure the predominance of them were African American people, and I know I do know that that uh, they were between young young men between 18 and 30 were the perpetrators. So, and, and how many, how many of those have been, you know, a video, how many videos have we seen of, of them? How many, how many times have we seen the wife of the young man or the man who was killed or the sister or the mother of the young man who was killed crying like George, Fa George Floyd's uh, mother was crying his, his girlfriend and his mother were crying yesterday. And it just brought tears and brought feelings to all of us when we see this kind of grief. With those mothers of those 500 people, they cried just as hard. Mm -hmm. They were just as grieved as George Floyd's mother was, was grieved. But we, didn't, we don't see it. They're, they're invisible. Mm -hmm. I was at a meeting this weekend by, uh, with, with a group of 33 religious leaders. And a, a man was making a presentation to us. And they had collected, they had been working with the DA's office and others, and they had collected some data around the, the murders in, in, in Philadelphia. And, and it was so interesting. 
of those 500 people, 499 people who were killed, the police know that they were killed. These murders were perpetrated by 250 people. It's only 250 people. It's not like all over the place. It's 250 people who are, who are committing these murders and they commit, they commit these murders year in and year out. Year, it's the same people over and over again who are, who are committing these murders. The reason they're not persecuted, prosecuted, is that people in the community don't want to tell. It's not caught on camera. It's not documented. And the people who, who, who are in the community who know these people, they're afraid to tell. So this is a, this is a dirty secret that's kept within our, in our community because we're afraid to tell. And it's not documented. There's no body cam who's documenting these things to put it out there so people can, can, can have some reaction. Well, got, he also showed, let me just say this, Sarah. Sure, he, he also showed us a video that he had taken of, he was at a cemetery recently. And you, you probably saw this on the news that, that uh, there was a, a burial at a cemetery in Southwest Philadelphia and a victim of, a, a, a murder victim was being uh, uh, buried. And the shooter comes to the cemetery and starts shooting up the cemetery because he didn't kill everybody who he wanted to kill the first time. And so he, he, he went to, at, at the same cemetery, same event, he stumbled over a grave because the grave, you know, it was still above ground. He stumbled over the grave and he saw one of his friends and he didn't even know his friend was dead. His friend is there. And he, he put the video on, it's about a 30 second video. And he started videoing these graves, all these young men and women, all young men and women who were killed right here in our city. And, and most of them are killed by our own people. They're not killed by the police. They're killed by us blacks on, on black. So how can we, and I'm not trying to take anything away from the whites killing, the, the white policemen killing black people, you know, but that's a small number compared to black on black and, and killing. And the black on black killing is not being talked about. It's not well, being, you know, So I'm going to beg to differ on that. We talk about it quite a bit on WURD. And I think that the, the point of this conversation, it's all connected. Everything we just talked about is connected because the reason we have some of these systemic um, problems is because of systemic wealth inequality, um, you know, racial health disparities, uh, you know, educational inequalities. And a lot of it stems, it, it, it is centered in poverty and the and generational poverty and lack of access to, to a lot of different um, resources and, and, and opportunities. And you all are here, we are talking about what the corporate community's responsibility is, what this, this diversity, equity, and inclusion, particularly in a city like Philadelphia that has the highest poverty rate of all the, the, the major cities in, in the country. You know, we, we know what our entrenched and intractable problems are here in Philadelphia, but we've got to like collectively address them in order for the, um, you know, the, 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 the challenges to be, to be um, addressed. And so, you know, I, I want to ask because again, you know, we know that there has been this um, renewed interest and renewed commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, but I, I want to see, and you can, I'm going to start with you, Delilah Wilson Scott from, from Comcast. Comcast has made a $100 million commitment to over several years to um, really try and tackle some of these big, big questions. And you have multiple programs that you're, you're um, implementing here in the city and across the country. And I wanted to see, like, like, as the director of diversity, what is your commitment and, and what exactly are you doing? And how do people access these resources that are being made available through Comcast? Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. I mean, the, the one thing I can say is um, it's going to take considerable time and focus effort and urgency to address the issues that we're talking about. You mentioned systemic and structural racism and how that leads to many different uh, issues and outcomes. And I think what 
when I think about the corporate community in particular and sort of how we can impact social justice, at the end of the day, it's about how we can in impact economic justice. Because if we didn't have the narrowing middle class, the type of wealth inequity, the lack of access in our communities, uh, some of these other issues would, wouldn't necessarily uh, be as uh, ex exacerbated. We saw that with COVID. So for us, we took a step back and a lot of times people think about corporations and how they play a role in diversity and they limit that or narrowly define that as it's just about workforce representation. Companies are well positioned to do a lot more than just increase their workforce from a diversity standpoint. We have to look at all the different stakeholders in our work and how we're impacting them. So for our, for our philanthropic commitment, we wanted to think about where are we uniquely positioned, where are we bringing experts to the table, expertise to the table, and more importantly, where are we bringing more than money? Because that's what matters at the end of the day. So we, we, one, it was all steeped in best way we can support social justice to think about economic justice first. So one, we really wanted to double down on our commitment to digital equity. So while we have the $100 million commitment in place, we recently announced for the next 10 years, we'll be putting a billion dollars into digital equity because we feel like Connectivity is one issue, and that was definitely brought to light during COVID. Um, many people that live right here in Philadelphia, where Wi-Fi is readily available, don't have access to connectivity. And that's just one step. More importantly, though, once you get connected, once you have access to technology, how do you monetize that? How do you turn that into a skill set that can create a business, an opportunity that you can walk away with a credential that really helps you move on that path to get on that path to economic mobility? And we see that through digital equity, which is what we've been expanding. We also know that supporting black owned businesses, black and brown owned businesses is a key way to go and is, is wealth creation at its core. Um, being able to control your destiny in that way and not just having access to capital, but also to the, the important services in addition to that, mentoring, coaching, network and connectivity support and marketing like we're doing through Comcast Rise. In fact, next week we'll be announcing the 100 grantees, small business grantees through our program all BIPOC owned businesses right here in our city. They'll receive $10,000 grants as well as access to coaching and, and support to continue to grow their businesses, especially during this tough time. So those are the couple of different ways. We're tackling it a number of different ways, but we see, we see digital skills and economic mobility at the core of everything we're doing. You're on mute. <laughs> Gotta stop doing that. Mute is like the bane of my existence. Um, just want to reintroduce the panel. I'm Sarah Lomax Reese, I'm president and CEO of WURD, and we're doing a special uh, panel C suite roundtable discussion with uh, three uh, amazing uh, leaders in the, this, the corporate community here in Philadelphia. You just heard from Delilah Wilson Scott from Comcast. We also have Ramona Risco Benson from PICO and Michael Rashid who's the Commerce Director of the City of Philadelphia. And we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, April apparently is Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Month, so uh, we got a month for everything. So Ramona, I wanna go to you. Um, what, about, uh, what about PICO in this moment? You know, the, the, I know that you personally have been committed to these issues uh, as an entrepreneur and as, as the head of the African American Museum. Um, and now as a corporate leader at PICO, but um, what, what are kind of the, the tangible, actionable things that PICO is doing to wade into this moment to create more equity and access for, and I'm gonna say specifically for black Philadelphians. So let me back up for just a moment and, and thanks for the, the, the way you have thoughtfully put this panel together. Um, uh, and I am very, um, appreciative of the comments that Delilah shared about what Comcast is doing, because I think it's awesome. You know, when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, PICO has been in this space for decades, having these conversations within um, the, the folks who, who, who work for PICO, um, looking at um, how we can engage um, our team members um, in these important and, and thoughtful conversations um, about what's going on um, with their work or with their experiences, with our culture 
uh, as a company and then what is taking place externally um, that has led to some of the conversations that we have been having even more thoughtfully in the last in the last year so um, I appreciate the fact that the company um, has really provided leadership for these conversations um, and the fact that employees can feel very comfortable having these discussions um, with leadership or with with their peers um, about things that um, they feel very passionate about as it relates to as it relates to some of the things that we have been discussing I, I'll tell you something I um, for for us um, you know companies are looking at you know what is the wheelhouse here you know what is it that we um, should be focused on what is it that we can uh, do to move the needle and and very similar to Comcast Independence Blue Cross and a number of the other companies in our city and region um, we know that we have a part to play in this and we know that we um, we provide uh, part of the solutions uh, to some of these uh, discussions that are taking place and some of the challenges being done. So for, for us, you know, our CEO, Mike Innocenzo, talks about the poverty in Philadelphia and the fact that, you know, there is more that we can do as a company um, to, to weigh in with that. So workforce development for us has become a significant part of how we are moving forward. Um, and we are doing the, the other things, and I'll get to that, but workforce development for us is where we are putting our stake in the ground. Um, number one, we're looking at where we have- what does that mean, but go ahead. You're, gonna, you're about to say. <laughs> yeah. We you know, we, we know that um, we can do more to uh, provide access to the jobs that we will have available at PICO and to the jobs that will be available through the contracting companies that work with our company. Um, we know that we can do more to um, develop and train people so that they can qualify for the, the, um, uh, the expectations of those roles. And so we're, we, you know, we're looking at um, how to have more access um, to the job openings with our community organizations we partner with, how to provide more um, support for um, community-based organizations we're partnered with for training, um, for training and development, um, for being prepared for the entrance test for many of our craft roles. Um, looking at how to educate kids so that as they move through school, they become more aware of jobs in the energy sector, and and then um, uh, jobs that would be open in general, whether they have a high school diploma or a college degree. So there's more that we're, we're doing to try to support those things, whether it's partnering with uh, Philadelphia OIC, where, where we have our smart energy training program, or with Community College of Philadelphia with our gas mechanic training program, um, with, the, um, with CLC, which is the um, Community Learning Center, um, providing um, classes for adults so that they become more familiar with the entrance exams for some of these roles. And these roles are important to us because when we talk about poverty, these jobs, in fact, um, are living wage jobs. These jobs are, um, are such that they can lift up families. So, you know, our, our leadership is clearly focused on doing what it can to make a difference. And we're doing that with um, the programs that I've mentioned to you and others, um, but also through the team that we have um, installed um, as part of my corporate and community relations team um, to focus specifically on workforce development initiatives. Um, looking at those, um, those opportunities and identifying the barriers within our company and for others so that we can really be a part of the solution when it comes to this. That's so uh, Ramona Risco Benson uh, from, from PICO. We're talking with a, a panel of 
uh, C-suite executives is what I'm calling calling this panel um, here in the city of Philadelphia. And I'm going to go to you, Michael Rashid. Um, you know, you're the the commerce director, and and we have some conflicting um, statistics about the state of Black-owned businesses in Philadelphia. You know. Um, the Pew Charitable Trust, I think their report in 2016 said that only 2.5% of the businesses in Philadelphia were, were black owned uh, businesses and some are, are um, questioning that statistic saying it's too low, but we know that comparatively to other uh, major cities are the number of black owned businesses here in Philadelphia is staggeringly low and, and so, you know, like, like I want to ask you as the Commerce Director what can the city do to address these issues? Because I'm, I'm so encouraged by what uh, is happening with Comcast and Pico, but as someone said before, there is this like urgent, there's an urgency around this moment. And we know that these issues around poverty and lack of access to funds to invest in black businesses has been decades and centuries long. And so how is, is what we're doing both at the city level and at the corporate level enough right now to meet the moment? No. I just asked you like four questions in one. <laughs> well, probably the answer for all of them is no. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, well, well, a statistic, we, we are dead last, Philadelphia, we are dead last when compared to other major cities, Atlanta, Washington, uh, Chicago, Los Angeles, in terms of ownership of black, black ownership of their own businesses. We're dead last, absolutely last. But we also, and going back to your earlier point, in terms of the connection between all of these things, we're also dead last in terms of the minimum wage uh, mm. that's being offered to people. Uh, there's 41 states uh, that have a higher minimum wage than we do. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, states around us, there is no state around us that has a minimum wage even close to what, as, as low or close as what uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania has, even West Virginia. Mm. higher minimum wage than Pennsylvania has. And, and so as, as, as the mayor said, when he was asked about the 400 murders, 499 murders, you know, he, he says, you got to understand there's a connection between gun violence and the guns that are on the street. And every, we take guns off the street every month, more guns come on the street. It's easier to get a gun in Philadelphia than it is to get a driver's license. So the guns are just pouring in, pouring in, pouring in. So there's a connection there. There's a connection between uh, our poverty rates and, and crime. I know for a fact, I know for a fact, these guys are not standing on the corner selling drugs in the rain, in the snow, getting wet, taking a risk of going to jail, getting killed, selling these drugs, because that's their, that's their life's aspiration in life is to sell drugs. They're doing it because they're desperate. In their minds, there, there is no alternative to what they're doing. So they got to go out and make a living. The, the guy's 6'4", he's 230 pounds. He got to eat, his family got to eat. He wants to, you know, so he got to make some money. So all of these things, it's no question, all of these things are, are connected. Uh, we, 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 and I'm going to talk about the city, but we are so, so inspired and happy about the kinds of things that uh, Comcast is doing, the kinds of things that uh, uh, PICO is doing. I spoke to a group of graduates today from this uh, um, Goldman Sachs 10,000. Goldman Sachs, 10,000 small businesses. They graduated 60 something small business owners uh, in, in Philadelphia today. And, and these are mom and pop, you might call them mom and pop kind of businesses, people who came to learn more about how to manage their business, how to grow their business, and some really, really good stories and really good things they're teaching these people. We're inspired because so many corporations are following the lead of PICO, following the lead of Comcast, uh, and, and, and doing these kinds of things. The, the, the city, we, I, I believe the best thing that we can do, other than pass some laws, obviously the legal environment is very important, and, and we can do more in terms of the legal environment. Another meeting I was at this morning had to do with minority contracting for, for construction and things like that, and how come we don't have more teeth in, in, in our rules? Over and over again, people come to us and say, oh yeah, 50%, we will hire 50% of minorities you know, on, on a job or something like that, and they get the contract, and then, you know, a year and a half later when the job is done and they've been paid, they said, well, we tried, you know, we had, we put ads in the paper, we had job fairs, nobody came, you know, that's quite frankly, that's BS and we have to do better. We have to do better in terms of putting teeth in these contracts, 
holding people's feet to the fire so that they they actually do what they say what they say they're going to do. So there's laws that we can that we can do uh, to answer your question, Sarah. There's also right now, luckily, you know, as we come out of the pandemic, and thank God we have a, a, a an administration in Washington that understands the needs of cities. Uh, we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to pour money sort of, after we get past the pandemic, pour money into black and brown communities to help them develop. The mayor's budget that he just uh, un unveiled has a lot of great initiatives to do that. Some of those initiatives are coming through commerce, some are coming through other, other agencies of, of, of the city government. And we expect that more, to, more will come down the road in, in, the, uh, in the president's inf infrastructure uh, uh, package. So we are 100% committed to that. Our partners are, are PIDC, which is, City, sort of the city's uh, bank that they can do a lot more than what we can do. And they're putting an unprecedented amount of money into those kinds of activities. Uh, the airport is doing a great job in terms of minority contracting, et, et, et cetera, et cetera. But if I can just say the biggest thing that I think that we can do is to work like work with companies like Pico and like Comcast and, and, and hear about and, and help, help them to advertise the great programs that they are doing and go out to pr the private sector around the city, around the region, and say, okay, you have a commitment. Here's the best, here's the best practice that was done by PICO. Here's the best practice that was done by, by Comcast. You can do it because they don't, they don't know what to do, Sarah. They have, they have the desire to do something, but they really don't know how to implement these programs. And Comcast has figured it out. PICO has figured it out. Uh, I, have to, I have to give a shout out to Thomas Jefferson University. They have figured it out. Big time. I'm, I'm, I love their program. Don't, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I, I don't really have a lot of patience for that, for that they don't, people don't know how to do it. People, yeah. people know how to do it. Cause like you just said, Comcast, Pico, there are lots of examples, Thomas Jefferson, of people who know how to do it. So, you know, miss me with, I don't know how to do it. That, that just does not fly in 2021. It really doesn't. So, you know, I, I don't know I how to do it, Sarah. They don't know how to do it. Excuse. Huh? I mean, they don't know how to do it. They don't know how to do it. I believe you. Listen, listen, we live in a world of silos. We live in a world of silos. Okay, okay. They might not know how to do it, but they could darn sure figure it out because we got, you know, Google, we got YouTube, we got, we got lots of resources to, to, to figure stuff out in, in the 21st century. But anyway, I'm not going to argue with you, you know, about this because I just, I just don't buy that. I don't buy that people don't know how to do it. I think they lack the will. And, and it goes to kind of my next question. And I'm going to- I'm going to give you some names of people you can invite to your show, <laughs> all right? Some of these executives, and you will soon find out they don't have a clue. And, and I'm, you, I'm not saying that they don't have a clue, that, that I, I disagree. I'm just saying that they should, that's not, that's not an excuse. But go no, ahead. No, 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 it's not an excuse, no. I, you, you I, it's not an excuse. I'm I'm just coming uh, actually between the two of you in 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 saying this um, it can be done but it is work people do have to be willing to invest the time and resources um, to make a difference in that area that's right so that's and, and that's lot, really important it's not that it can't be done but it sure as heck is going to take some it'll take some time and some resources and, and i think that's the point sarah is making right so if mm -hmm. you wanted to do it you can absolutely figure out a path to get there you know we have incredible resources right here in in philadelphia even if you didn't want to go to the corporate community we have della at the enterprise center um we have pidc Anne and her team are excellent like there are people who live, breathe economic development every single day. And I think they'd be more than happy, as would any of us, to advise on where is to start. I think just being paralyzed is not an option, not in this moment. Yeah, and that's what that's what I was going to get to next. And I'll, I'll come to you, Delilah, because one thing, you know, anybody, and, and as Black people, we, we are invited to conversations around DEI all the time. And I, I mean, and um, anybody who has been in this space for any period of time knows that it's all about leadership. If the people at the top of the organization don't embrace this in like an authentic and, and complete way, it, it, it very rarely trickles down to the rest of the organization. And the trap that I've seen 
too often is like, oh, we're going to do diversity by hiring entry level people and, and that's it. But I wanted to see, you know, Delilah, from your experience at both Goldman Sachs and at Comcast, like, what is like, what do you see as the, the, um, the thing that actually makes a difference in a corporation really owning this and putting the money and the resources and the commitment behind it in a, in a real way? I mean, I think the first thing companies have to realize is um, the, your diversity, equity, and inclusion work can't work in a silo, right? It's not up to your chief diversity officer to create an, a, diverse, a diverse and inclusive environment. That is shared responsibility uh, that everyone has to be held accountable for. And you have to look across various different aspects of the company. So when we think about it here, and uh, you know, we really put this formal structure in place a little over a decade ago, but we think about governance. So that's not just where your C-suite is, but that's where your corporate board is. We're, you know, we're fortunate uh, at Comcast to have Ken Bacon on our board. He's actually our longest standing independent director, director after American and he really challenges Brian and our corporate board and us as leaders and the committee he chairs is the governance committee which is is who has oversight over our corporate diversity and equity and inclusion initiatives so reporting to him on a quarterly basis making sure the board is aware and also using that as a point of education for people who may not have been uh, uh, close to, to diversity uh, or, or just think differently about it quite frankly especially since last year so Governance a big piece of it. I also think on, um, you know, we, we talked about workforce and again, I, I agree with you that the easy part is hiring. Um, the more difficult part is retention and creating an environment where people can succeed. Um, and everybody can pop with the big hiring numbers, especially on entry level, undergraduate classes, that type of thing. But how many people are making their work through your organization? How many people are being successful? What what does their onboarding experience look like and how are they being cultivated? I think that's a big, a big area. We know that there's so many studies that show that uh, black executives don't get honest feedback in their reviews, um, but they're also more likely not to get, um, you know, they might be considered high potential, but they're not tapped on the shoulder to take on more responsibility. <laughs> And building those types of, of practices into your work is, is key. We already heard a lot about supplier diversity and our contractors, not just our contractors, but who they are subcontracting to. Um, and again, you know, when, when we stood up our two buildings here, we work with a number of different partners, including Charmaine Matlock-Turner, who many of us know at the Urban Affairs Coalition, uh, and as well as Dell at the Enterprise Center, to source diverse suppliers so we could have a significant amount uh, of business that we were able to to uh, to give to diverse owned businesses so really looking across every single aspect of what you have to impact at your company is huge and of course you know, like you, Sarah, programming and how we how we do our storytelling work, who's doing the storytelling work um, is important. And, uh, and and working with different businesses to do that well and different talent to do that well is key. And and you also have to be in partnership. Um, you know, you we, we didn't read your bio, but all of us know you are right legendary and visionary in this space in terms of black owned media. Um, but, you know, we exist because you exist. So we also have have so many things that we share in common. All the new initiatives you have underway that are highlighting entrepreneurs, especially tech entrepreneurs, that's a mutual interest. We both do better by highlighting those stories. Um, positive stories about our community as well as educational stories about how we move forward. Um, all, all tied to the issues that we're talking about. But I think, you know, how a company has to recognize that its voice, CEO, corporate voice, media platforms, its workforce, its supplier contracts, its business, all of that helps create an inclusive culture. So it's about that scope. And are you willing to make sure diversity is flowing through your organization as opposed to, oh, that's the team that sits on XYZ floor that we bring out for Black History Month. That's not diversity. Mm. That's going to get us where we need to go. Absolutely. And, and you know, I think the, I'm sorry, the, the, the point Delilah makes is really an important one because really when we talk about DEI, it is a comprehensive approach. It cannot be a one-off and it cannot just be one, one stream of thought around what, what that 
could look like. It's got to be comprehensive. And it's interesting when you think about where some of our companies are um, in this discussion, uh, it, it is absolutely a journey. It is not something that, you know, you, you did two, two decades ago and, you know, we did that already and then move on to, to something else. It's got to be where everybody is all in at all levels, all departments, looking at how to, how to affect change in the organization and to look at how, how those things that are, um, are, are significant about the, the company's um, resources and assets can be leveraged um, to support other activities uh, similar to what we discussed with uh, some of the external relationships. So I, yeah. you know, I absolutely agree with that. Mike, Mike I know you, um, you were clearly on, 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 on that path with what you're doing with the city. Well, so Sarah, Sarah, my, my, can I ask my, you, can I ask you, I want to ask oh, you a I'm sorry. question, <laughs> Michael, but, and, and you can respond to that, but <laughs> I feel like I'm being a little bit of a bully with you. Mike. A little, a little bit, a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. Um, but let me just reintroduce the panel. We are, we're doing a special conversation today. I'm Sarah Lomax Reese and I'm the, pub, uh, the publisher, I'm the president and CEO of WURD radio. And we're doing a, a special conversation with, uh, C-suite uh, executives uh, for equity, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion month. And we're talking with, that was Ramona Risco Benson, uh, who is the corporate and community relations director for PICO. Um, and we're talking with Ramon, um, Delilah Wilson-Scott, executive vice president and chief diversity officer for Comcast Corporation and president of the Comcast NBC Universal Foundation, and Michael Rashid, who is the commerce director for the city of Philadelphia. And so I'm just going to slide this in and then you can get to your point. But um, I think Delilah referenced board participation as a major part of this equation. And I'm, I know that a few years ago, there was uh, an effort from the Chamber of Commerce, the Phil Greater Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce, to do an, a whole kind of analysis of diversity on boards, corporate boards, and things like that. And, and I wanted to ask you, Mike, you know, what role does the, the lack of diversity on corporate boards play into this whole notion of kind of um, diversity, equity, and inclusion and more access and uh, inclusion? Okay. Can we extend the show for another hour? <laughs> we can do a part two. How's that? A little part two. But I, I just want to say that um, you, you said, I, I said they don't know what to do. <laughs> No, no, no. This is all. We're, we're, I'm not going. I'm not just going back. But then Delilah and and uh, Ramona just talked about the most important things that, that they have to do. And 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 my words, it starts at the top. It starts with the, at the board. It starts at the CEO's level. And it's a serious, serious commitment, not just a press release and not just writing a check for ten thousand dollars and getting in the newspaper. It takes a serious commitment. They, most of them don't really understand that. Most of them that I talk to, they don't understand that this is serious. And it, it's, it's a change in culture. This is a, we, have a, we have a racist culture here in America. For 400 years, it's a racist culture. And that culture, there's effects of that culture in our contracting and the way we look at potential vendors. And on the other side, there's part of this racist culture plays out in the way our vendors present themselves, quite frankly. That's something else people don't talk about. But we need to talk about that too. So that's what I mean when I say they don't know what to do. They don't, they, they don't understand the very, the very basic concept that something as big as this, attacking or, or addressing flaws in our culture, it has to stop, has to start at the very top of my company. And I'm going to take some, me as CEO, I'm going to take some hits if I step out here and start pushing things like that. Absolutely. That's what, that's what they don't understand. Yeah, yeah. What was that song? Yeah. I don't know who recorded it, but action speaks louder than words. Yeah. Because yeah. folks do a whole lot of talking, but it's the action. That's right. Um, that you up. can look to and you can measure um, and expect as outcomes. And, and, and sustained action. Sustained you know, action. When we are well past this yeah. George Floyd moment, it's not about what companies committed to last year. It's about in five years from now, in 10 years from now, what types of outcomes and what types of sustained commitment is still in place. 
Right. Yeah, so I, I want to, I've been um, really hogging the mic uh, during this conversation and have not uh, um, invited in questions from the listening audience, but we do have a question. Um, if, if people want to weigh in, we only have a few more, more minutes, um, but you can put uh, a question in the chat at, uh, and on Facebook, um, Facebook forward slash forward, F-O-R-W-U-R-D, and you can put a question in there or you can call in and uh, pose a question and, and Troy will share it with me, 215-634-8065. Um, but one of the questions that we have already is, um, um, are there corporations willing to help with economic infrastructure plans? You know, so, and, and I, this might be a, um, a Michael Rashid question because I think that, you know, we, we're hearing so much from President Biden about, you know, infrastructure and trillions of dollars being plowed into infrastructure. Um, how is that gonna translate into Philadelphia in terms of economic infrastructure plans that will translate into jobs? And, you know, I'm a big proponent of wealth creation. We've got to figure out ways to generate more wealth in the black community in order to support our institutions and our, our people. So what do you say, Mike? Uh, if it, uh, I'm not real sure what, you, what your viewer means by uh, infrastructure. If, uh, what, what do you think they mean? Um, I guess I'm, I'm going to translate that into, you know, how will the, the federal infrastructure dollars transfer or translate to the local level to create more um, economic opportunity oh, okay. here in the city? That's different than what I thought. Well, well, well that's, that's, I, I'm probably taking, I'm probably like extrapolating, but that's the way I'm interpreting it. There, there is, there is specific language, you know, this infrastructure package is huge. It hasn't passed. Who knows what's going to happen, you know, but there's, as, as proposed, a lot of, a lot of money and a lot of priority in that money for the creation of wealth, for not just contracting. Contracting is good jobs are good, but specifically the, the, the creation of wealth. Uh, and I'll just, I'll just here, here's a small example of creation of wealth. Recently uh, at, at PIDC, uh, a young woman came to us, uh, very small business uh, on, in the neighborhood corridor, and uh, she was being threatened with, um, uh, the landlord was gonna go up, go up on her rent. And if she didn't go up, pay the, pay the new price, she was gonna get kicked out. Uh, we helped her to buy that, buy her building. We help her to buy her building. So now she has control and nobody can come along and say, you know, your lease is up, double the rent, stuff like that. So, so this, this is what we really got to have. And, and I, again, I could talk for a long time about that, but um, I think, I'll, let's see if I can summarize it. I really believe that coming out of the pandemic, our neighborhood corridors are going to be way more valuable for people in the suburbs than they are right now. It's, people are not going to be working downtown. They're going to be staying in their homes and they're not going to want to go downtown to have lunch. They want to have lunch in the neighborhood. And some of those neighborhoods, is, this is our neighborhood, but they want to, and you see it happening in other cities. Some people call it gentrification. So to the extent that we can buy our business, buy our building, and actually own the corridor, we have way more control of that. Some of the money that's coming down from the federal government and from, and from, uh, and from the city, quite frankly, is going to be devoted so helping people do that, so they can they can buy their business, they can buy their building, and actually own own some of it instead of just being a contractor. Absolutely. So we're just about out of time, um, but I wanted to to ask you each, and and it'll have to be a short response, but a, kind of a personal question about how you um, how you arrived at this you know level in your career. What kind of um, you know, mentors or what kind of interventions happened in your life to allow you to um, to um, move up the corporate ladder? Because I, it's not easy to be uh, an, an African American person at this at these very high executive levels. And I'm just curious if each of you could speak to maybe one um, one either a person or an experience that made the difference in your trajectory and your career? And I'll start with you, Delilah. You know, I, I do think it involves having a diverse set of mentors. So when I think of my kitchen cabinet and people who have been willing to help me, I would say it started um, 
there was the first woman actually I reported to, uh, she, you know, without my knowledge, she went to HR because she wanted to compare my compensation. When I first started working with her, she thought it was lower than where the other team members were who were at my level. And so she, on her own, got that equity study, immediately updated my compensation. And so she sort of walked me through that process. And I was, you know, first of all, I didn't even know at that point in time that she had the ability to do that, that it would be addressed if she raised it. And then, you know, I asked her, well, how was I supposed to even know? You know, like I entered the, 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 the company at a set level along with other people and other people got opportunities and, and bumps that I didn't even know were possible. And so she taught me a lot about one, how to, how to ask questions and challenge um, appropriately. But two, she just taught me a good lesson about, you know, you should always know where you fall compensation wise. Um, um, and and she did that without me even asking her to do that for me. So a lot of my earlier mentors were people who stepped out for me and saw something in me and saw potential in me that I didn't even know that I was capable of seeing myself. And then I think as you progress in your career, having people that agree with you, commiserate with you, as well as people who who can challenge you on your most, um, you know, your your toughest development areas, you got to be open to that feedback and willing to address it. So just having Having people that I love, but having people that um, those truth tellers, I mean, that's that's been key to me being able to, to get to where I've been so far. And I still have a lot of work to do. You are never done. Never done, never done. Uh, Mike Rashid, who who or what influenced you to? Well, uh, you know, I, have to I have to give credit, a whole bunch of credit to Mr. Dan Hilferty, who you know, took took a big chance on me when I, I was I was new to Philadelphia. Never nobody I had no network. No one knew he knew me, and he took a chance on me. And the former CEO of, of former Independence CEO, Blue Cross. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Uh, so Dan Hilferty was the person. I think the activity that has sparked has projected me uh, more than anybody, more than anything else, has been networking. Network. Mm -hmm. You can never do enough networking. You can never do enough relationship building. And uh, and uh, that's another show, Sarah. We talk about, <laughs> yes. about networking because I, I mean I I tell the young people all the time. I mean you can never do enough. Never eat lunch alone. You know you, mm. you always put always put favors in the bank. Always try to help people out. You never know when those favors going to come back with with interest. You know to help you out. So and yeah. I, I, all these things I'm saying right now, Mr. Dan Hilferty. Excellent, excellent. Ramona Risco Benson from Pico. Um, mentors, what or or who? Awesome. So I, I love the truth tellers. Um, and when I think about my foundation, of course, my grandmother, my mother and my aunt um, really kind of started that um, that area of focus for me, you know, telling me the truth. Huh. But in college, University of Pittsburgh, it was Dr. Barbara Sizemore and Dr. Rennell Lilly, Sharice Lilly's mother. Oh. They were awesome women who spent an enormous amount of time with me um, and really helped to guide my steps. Uh, when I think about coming into Philadelphia, and I've been here now about 30 years, um, Shirley Dennis, when she was at Pico, she was always giving a uh, sharing wisdom, which I thought was just pretty incredible. Amina Young, who we lost a few years ago, um, she was always good for, you know, how, how do you direct uh, someone's steps? Uh, Delisle mentioned someone who was a, a big partner of PICO's, um, the Urban Affairs Coalition. Well, Charmaine Matlock-Turner is someone I admire. I love her, and she is always very generous with her time and sharing her, her thoughts and wisdom. But even someone like the person um, that came before Michael in this role uh, um, with the Department of Commerce, Harold Epps. You know, Harold is just someone who he tells it like I've it is. A truth -teller. He's a truth -teller. He's a truth -teller. Harold, you know, he tells it like it is, but he but he shares he shares his wisdom and time with you. Um, businessman Bill Wilson, who has spent an awful lot of time with me, especially when I was in business. And someone I, I can't forget because I just think he just keeps going and giving is Dwight Evans, Congressman mm -hmm. Evans. Um, so, so many people, uh, Ernie Jones, um, I, I could go on and on, but 
I have not found people in Philadelphia to be difficult to establish relationships with when you are looking to um, kind of continue your personal development and journey here. I've, I've just met an awful lot of people who have given me their time. So. So, so the last, the very last question, if people want to get more information about either the, the workforce development opportunities at PICO or the, you know, the, the Comcast small business initiatives um, or the, the, the programs at the Commerce Department, how do they access that information? And I'll start with you, Delilah. So one, for the small business program, you can visit ComcastRise.com. So that talks about how you access support for networking and technology, marketing, as well as the, the cash grants that we've just done. Um, in terms of all of our DEI initiatives, including how we're supporting digital equity, if you visit our Comcast corporate site, everything is there to give you more information about that also. So those would be the places. Thank you. Um, Ramona? And with Pico, you can absolutely start with uh, pico.com backs backslash community. Um, you can always start there for um, information on our grants, on our community programs. Um, and we can certainly uh, be available to you if you want to call 215-841-4791. And someone on my team can certainly um, take you to where you need to go or answer your questions. Michael Rashid, what's, where, how, where should people go to get more information about what the city has to offer uh, people or businesses? Uh, Philip.gov, philip.gov slash commerce. Philip.gov slash commerce. Excellent. And I know you have something that's happening twice a month where people can come in and get one-on-one. Yeah, -on -one. Is that what it's called? Twice a month it, and it's virtual. You can get one-on-one -on -one consulting twice a month from one to four, the second and fourth Wednesday, I'm sorry, first, second and fourth Monday of every month. And you can sign up right there on uh, fellow.gov. And then we have, we have accountants, we have management experts, we have all kinds of consultants that will be available. And it's one-on-one -on -one consulting, you just sign up for it. So I wanna thank each of you so much for participating in today's conversation, our C-suite roundtable and celebration of diversity, equity and inclusion uh, month. Um, this conversation will be on our livelihood website. If you go to wurdworks.com, wordworks.com, we'll have lots of information about uh, jobs and, and career resources and small business development. And this, uh, this program will be hosted there as well. And um, again, thank you so much, Ramona Risco Benson, Corporate and Community Relations Director for PICO. Delilah Wilson-Scott, Executive Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer for Comcast Corporation and President of the Comcast NBC Universal Foundation, and my dear friend, Michael Rashid, <laughs> Commerce Director of the City of Philadelphia. Thank you all so much for your time and your, your insights and your uh, inspiration. Have a Thank great you. rest of your day. Thank, Thank you, you. Enjoyed it. Thank still. you very much. Really enjoyed it. Thanks.